Hi, everyone. Uh, can you all hear me? I guess, yep, it's working. Um, so it's good, great to be back at Swinog and to see all of you again. Um, over the last uh, few years, I guess, during the pandemic as well, uh, I've been working a bit on my BGP implementation. Um, and I thought it would be a nice opportunity to come here today and kind of describe the kind of technical background and how I implemented it, um, as well as the possible future directions that I'd like to take this work in. Uh, so with that, let's get started. Um, so a bit about me. Um, I've been at Swinog uh, a few times now. I think three or four. This might, might be my fourth time. Um, I have a personal AS, uh, number 210036, um, and I'm using that just for my personal home network and for experimenting around and peering at various uh, networks around uh, in, in Europe. Um, I started becoming interested in BGP around uh, 2018 uh, when I was doing my master's at ETH and working with some research groups there, um, looking at what kind of academic work was going on in the space and trying to write more automation and pulling in BGP feeds. And I realized, hey, I really want to do more code in, in this space and like um, wondering how I integrate with BGP implementations. Um, and that kind of led me to, in the end, uh, make my own implementation. Uh, this is the third attempt uh, written in Rust, um, and I'll go a bit into the technical details of how I ended up there. Um, so some of you might ask, but why make another implementation? Um, and what I would say to that is that the way that networking infrastructure has evolved in the last 10, 20 years has really changed a lot. Um, we see, like in, for example, in data centers, a lot of uh, dense topologies like fat tree or class topologies where there are a lot of switches, a lot of routers, and a lot of automation going in and programming routes into these um, devices. And it's gotten a lot more complex. Um, you can imagine uh, before where you would like log into a router and manually type commands uh, to reconfigure that router, but that's not really how large scale networks are operated these days. You have like uh, configuration management systems, maybe you have like version control and a template which then gets expanded and applied to lots of different network elements around the country, around the world. Um, so I wanted to make an implementation which is more conducive to this kind of model, to have an API-based um, configuration plane where that's the only way that the device can be configured, the only way that the, the BGB speaker can be configured so you have really one view into it. Um, and I noticed doing things like writing configuration files using like domain-specific languages was a bit um, hard to test, and like, how, how do you write a unit test uh, for a configuration file? Um, and I realized that using uh, like full-fledged programming language uh, makes it easier to do things like unit testing, integration testing, um, and integration with uh, these uh, systems. So that's kind of the background of how I got into uh, doing this project. Um, so let's look at some of the requirements of uh, what a modern BGP speaker uh, could have. Um, so as I said earlier, uh, configuration is centrally managed, applied by automation. Uh, so the less humans you have in the loop, uh, I would say the more reliable the service becomes because there are no more typos, there are no more like doing things in the wrong order. Um, you write the code to dip do your deployment once, you make sure it works, and then the automation repeatedly applies that. Um, and in there you can have safety checks, you can have all sorts of um, feedback loops to check, like, hey, is, is this configuration behaving as I expect it, for example. Um, the second point is that uh, when doing uh, some experimentation by hand, I, I wanted to look deeper into like what is going on inside these routing demons, um, what the internal state is, and, and like how to monitor that. And I realized a lot of the monitoring tools were like built around like for example command line uh, output and like parsing the text that comes out of a command line output and then feeding that into tools like Prometheus for doing graphs or alerting and things like this. But and seems kind of fragile and brittle to like, go through a tool which is designed for a human to read and then do putting that output into automation. Why not just have an API directly which has a structured format and feeds that directly into uh, whatever monitoring or alerting tools you're using. Um, and third, but certainly not least, um, I wanted to kind of play around with more uh, experimental protocols, like looking into things like uh, BGPsec, and uh, I couldn't find um, much implementations of BGPsec around and I wanted to play around with that. So I was looking through the source code and realized like, hey, if I make my own BGP implementation, which is very modular, has clearly defined interfaces, it might make it easier for like researchers or academics or people in industry to write plugins or modules which can directly take uh, some internal state 
which is not exposed by an API, for example, and then build um, additional uh, things like BGP psych or like RPKI integration into it. Um, so that's kind of what I wanted to address by my implementation. Uh, so about the implementation itself, um, this is the third attempt that I tried. Um, it wasn't very good in the first two. Um, the first version was in Go, and then I moved to C++, um, and then finally settled on Rust for the for this version um, because of the the ecosystem of packages that I found um, and the fact that it's it's really a memory safe and concurrently safe language uh, where there are built-in guide rails and the compiler has built-in checks to prevent things like uh, data races, which can lead to very unpleasant surprises when you're writing um, network control plane applications. Um, so right now, what does this, the uh, implementation actually do? Uh, it can be confusing because um, a lot of BGP implementations you find out there do much more than just BGP. They do things like uh, OSPF for um, synchronizing the Linux uh, uh, data plane, like the IP addresses you have, and then pulling that into their view of the world. Um, I just wanted the thing that announces some routes and takes routes in from peers and does something with it. Um, so my implementation is really just focusing on BGP and exposing those routes. Um, so right now, what it can do, it can connect to BGP, BGP peers, uh, receives routes from those peers and stores them in the data structure um, for that peer, and then uh, centralizes all the routes from all the peers into this rib manager, so the routing information base, uh, so that has the view of all, all of the peers and what's reachable. Um, this aggregates by per prefix um, kind of grouping, so that you can query it and say, like, for this IP prefix, what are the, the paths? And then it'll tell you, oh, these peers are announcing these paths to me. Um, and the most Im interesting part, at least for me when implementing this, was that uh, I chose to make a RPC endpoint in the BGP speaker uh, that exposes all of this information. So the BGP speaker itself doesn't uh, need to concern itself with like talking to Netlink or talking to the forwarding plane to put the routes in. It just exposes an API, and then the user can write whatever automation to take routes from that API and program. Uh, for example, if you're using Linux router, program the kernel. If you're using DPP, you could do some integration there to program the user space router or whatever else you might want. Um, so the initial design looks a bit like this. Um, on the left side of the picture here, there are the peers. Uh, the peers send messages in, BGP update messages. Uh, there's some logic uh, that processes that, and then the, um, the software will stream the routes out to whatever client applications here, like, for example, taking that out and putting them into the forwarding plane. Um, so the parser itself was designed to be very modular um, and let users define like new message types, new path attributes very easily. Um, and I think that a design like this will make it easier for other people to go and experiment with new path, new path attributes and extending the, the software in a way which was previously harder to do with other implementations. Um, and the RPC interface that I chose, I, I chose to use gRPC because I found a nice library which uh, implements that in Rust. Um, and this provides both a view and a stream of the routing information base. Uh, so you can do a dump of, hey, give me all the routes that are currently there. And you can also stream out um, all the routes in a, in a live manner. So like you can open the connection and get in routes as they're coming in. Um, so let's talk a bit about the architectural decision, decisions in the software. Uh, so the BGP server itself, uh, as I kind of alluded to earlier, uh, just connects to the peers, parses the messages, um, and then puts them in some information base, the writing information base here. Um, and that's self-contained like, um, in itself and isn't concerned with things like automation, config files, um, programming the fib, that's all left up to clients to do. Um, the actual BGP state machine is contained within the, the box at the top, the peer state machine. So one peer state machine is made for each peer that um, you're connecting to, and that deals with processing the messages in there, um, and then uses a message passing interface um, between that peer state machine and the, the rib manager. So it's able to enqueue route updates uh, to there to be processed. Um, so I just want to explain a bit why I'm using a message passing based interface. Um, I found it uh, really easy to reason about the program when you have smaller units of logic. 
Um, so the pure state machine, for example, uh, only deals with one peer. You don't need to care about um, the view of the routes from other peers. It, it's felt very self-contained there. The parser is running um, there, uh, has some processing logic, applies the filters, for example, um, and then hands the message that's parsed and processed out uh, to the, the rib manager. So um, that can be like, it, it's run in a different thread, um, and we'll see a bit later how the, th how the threading is done. Um, but this should uh, give it a better scalability uh, when processing a lot of messages uh, coming in. Um, one point to note here is that the way that the logic is run um, and the way the mes messages are passed around means that update messages uh, can be cached. So when you're processing a packet uh, on the CPU, it can be in, in your CPU cache. And then when the message is passed to, for example, the rib manager, that code which runs in the rib manager can actually be scheduled on the same CPU core that was running the pure state machine before. And that way you have less uh, cache misses and uh, can process more messages. So just looking a bit at the, um, the threading models that you can use in writing network applications. Um, well, the simplest thing you can do is to have one thread per connection um, and just spawn a new like Linux p thread when you get a, a new peer connecting. Um, unfortunately, this does not scale well with larger and larger numbers, numbers of peers, and it's not really good utilization of the system resources. Um, so the second thing you can do is then um, use a dispatcher thread, so one thread which receives messages from all peers, and then every time there's a message, hands that off to the right worker thread, which can then load the state and do the processing for routes from that peer. Um, this can use a mechanism like uh, select or epoll uh, on the dispatcher thread to get, get the updates and um, send them out to the other worker threads. Um, but the approach I chose to use here was to use a, a runtime, and that's basically uh, some code which handles scheduling of tasks and uh, provides some message passing interfaces for you. And I found that in Rust, there are some nice libraries to do this, uh, and it really makes writing uh, complicated network applications much easier. Um, and then it removes the burden from the programmer to need to worry about hey, how to pass things around and how to make sure that the locality is correct uh, when you're uh, par parsing all the messages. Um, so the runtime I chose to use was a library called Tokyo. Um, it implements a scheduler for tasks in user space. Um, it's kind of like green threads uh, or Go routines in, in Go. Um, and creating new tasks is very, very cheap. Um, so the way that the application is written, there are tasks spawned for reading from peers. Uh, there are tasks spawned for processing uh, entries from the rib. And they, all of these tasks uh, are cooperatively um, scheduled. So whenever the task um, has work to do, it processes that and then yields control back to the scheduler to be able to process um, other messages and other, do other tasks. Um, the library also provides synchronization primitives like locks, timers, notifications, um, and really integrates it really well in the ecosystem. So it makes it easier to plug these things together. Um, and for actually parsing the messages, uh, I found a library called NOM, which implements a parser combinator framework. Um, what that really means is that you define um, what format you want to parse in terms of small functions. So for example, you can say, I want to take this number of bytes out and then combine that by um, passing these, these functions around and wrapping them. Uh, I have a little example in the next slide to make this a bit clearer. Uh, but the benefit of this is that the library takes care of doing things like advancing the pointer in the data that you're reading to prevent things like um, accidentally incrementing too much or um, other classes of bugs where the state of the parser is, isn't correct into the data. Um, so looking a bit at an example here, um, the type length value kind of paradigm is really common in networking protocols uh, where you have a type of what data you're reading in, a length of how long the data is, and then the actual value itself. Um, so this parse TLV function here gives an example of how to write such a parser using NOM. Um, it takes an input S, which is uh, like an array of bytes, and then outputs this result type, um, which is a tuple of the first element being the type and the second element being what the actual value is, is in there. Um, and the way we parse this is just by saying, hey, take a uint8, uh, and that's the type, um, then read a, another uint8 
um, over here using the length value, whoops, um, using length value, um, and then the parser takes care of reading that length, reading that number of bytes afterwards, putting that in the vector, and then we just return uh, this tuple of the type and the value. Um, so that makes it really easy to define um, how we want to parse network protocols. It makes it easy to read the RFC and then straight away go and write this parser without needing to go into like formal grammar specifications or all that you might have with other tools like Yak or Lex. Um, yeah. So the way I architected the parser was kind of following how BGP messages are structured. So for example, in an update message, you have some NLRIs of what's announced, what's withdrawn. Um, you have your path attributes. So like each of the purple boxes at the bottom have their own like parser, and then they get dispatched to based on what path attributes are contained in the message. Um, and this makes it really modular. It makes it really easy to add additional path attributes. For example, because you would just need to add one function to parse whatever new path attribute you want, and that gets automatically integrated into the parser. And then the application logic can also add uh, in a different part of the code um, that would process this path attribute, for example. So talking a bit about the API for streaming um, routes out of this um, out of the software. Um, so there's a library I found called Tonic, um, and this implements a gRPC client and server. Um, so gRPC uh, defines these uh, RPC interfaces using protobufs, um, so you can define your messages there and what methods that uh, you have on your server. Um, so how this fits into uh, the BGP implementation is that in the rib manager, well, there's the rib itself, which contains all the routes which peers to send data to. Um, and a list of subscribers, like who is interested in receiving updates to this uh, data structure. Um, so you get requests coming into the RPC server. Um, the request handler enqueues something in the subscriber list saying, hey, this other client is interested in getting routes uh, from the rib. Uh, and every time there's a rib uh, update, um, that gets sent to the subscriber back. And then the stream processor, which is just a method that runs per, per client, will get this update and send it over the, over the wire to that peer. Um, so this is kind of how like, the route update flow is sent, sent to clients. Um, so talking a bit about the future direction of the project, and obviously right now it's just a proof of concept. Uh, it's just barely working enough for me to use at home. Um, but I would like to use the, the base that's been built here to have some um, kind of more modern features uh, in the BGP implementation. Um, so I'd like to have things like uh, configuration canarying, so like trying out a new configuration first for a short amount of time, monitoring signals back from having applied that configuration and seeing like, hey, is, is the system still working as it should, it should work um, after doing this? And the benefit of this is that you can roll back if you know, hey, a particular configuration broke something. Um, I would like to implement uh, a more heterogeneous uh, forwarding plane, so like, as I explained earlier, the fact that the routes are streamed out by RPC makes it easy to write clients and program that into like hardware or different software implementations. Um, and then programmability, uh, just having more knobs to tweak uh, and integration with automation systems to make it really more seamless and have a first class support for using this as a network automation system. Um, so an example of how configuration canarying could work is that you have an RPC interface on the BGP server to put in a new configuration, and then some logic in the server would then take care of applying that configuration, um, monitoring the signals from the peers. For example, you can say, hey, if I lose more than 50% of the routes that I had before after applying this configuration, maybe something is bad and we should roll back. And um, like when dealing with networking things like manually, I've always like locked myself out of systems, like applied the wrong firewall rules and got locked out. Uh, the advantage of this approach is that uh, the thing which applies the configuration is within the BGP server itself, uh, and it can have its own timeout to undo the change and go back to a known good working state. Um, talking about more heterogeneous control planes, um, the route client uh, kind of software uh, just talks to this standardized um, RPC server interface, so you can really write whatever software you want there. If it's in a different language, not a problem. Um, you can do things like write uh, open flow connectors to like program uh, open flow rules into like hardware switches, um, use a Linux machine, or like use something like VPP, uh, as we saw the talk earlier from Pim today about 
uh, using this in a user space kind of model. Um, and programmability, um, so I really want to have first class support for um, things like modifying what routes are announced to peers, uh, maybe even sending individual message messages to peers um, by making an RPC to the BGP uh, implementation. Um, things like getting notifications out um, and statistics out for monitoring would be really useful. Um, and especially for m different use cases, like for operating a route reflector, uh, you, where you want to have more fine grain or maybe software-defined control of which routes get sent to who, um, this could be a useful thing. Um, another idea was to use something like eBPF um, to like have small bytecode programs that can be sent to the server that get executed on each uh, route update, for example, to decide what to do with it, To, for example, for more advanced filtering. And integration with uh, automation systems. So um, previously, I, I guess, like a lot of networking uh, systems use things like Rancid uh, to synchronize state back and forth, like to understand what's running on the, on the router. Um, but I think it, like in the direction that we're going into with like storing configurations in version control and applying that programmatically, um, it would be better to have first class support for uh, having a certain configuration version and storing that in some persistent database, for example, like etcd, uh, so that it can persist through restarts um, and you don't get like issues with file permissions, for example. Um, so yeah, there's still quite a bit uh, of implementation to go. It's not fully working yet. Uh, I would say it's only really suitable for a home use case right now. Um, but I do have some things on the immediate roadmap to work on. Um, and if anyone is interested, the code is all open source um, at this link here. Um, we welcome all contributions. If you're interested, um, just file like a, a bug or a pull request or whatever you'd like. Um, yeah, with that, I think that's the end of my slides. Um, are there any questions, comments? Hello. So um, to explore the RIB, you use gRPC. Um, but there is an ITF standard that is called uh, BMP. So I wonder why you are using gRPC instead of BMP, and if you foresee to support BMP or any comment? Cool. Um, I had seen BMP. I didn't really fully understand what it was used for. Um, I chose gRPC here um, because I was familiar with it and had like written some other automation before to receive routes over gRPC. I'd like to support BMP. I think I looked at the standard and it was a bit long. So then I just said, hey, what's the quickest way I can make this work? Because um, also like experimenting on my home network means that I don't have internet connectivity when my thing is broken. Um, but yeah, uh, file a, like a bug or a feature request or something uh, on the GitHub repo uh, for BMP support, and then we can, I mean, there's no official roadmap, but I guess we can make one. <laughs> Thanks. Any other question? At the back, there's a question. Um, hello, I'm Thomas from DKIX. Uh, really nice work. Um, I have a question. Uh, if, if I hear P2B speakers, I always hear route servers. Do you have thought about the use case of a route server that could uh, be handled with this? Uh, yes. Um, so, with the API, uh, um, kind of the API example earlier, um, I think that having more programmability in the control plane makes it better for things like route servers, where you can, for example, in the web portal for um, like IXP clients uh, get more detailed information uh, directly from the, the BGP speaker itself. Um, one use case which could be interesting is like for members of the IXP uh, wanting to debug, like, hey, why is my route not being accepted by the route server? Um, being able to have that direct API uh, into the speaker itself and extracting uh, maybe like here's the policy and this rule in the policy denied this route. Um, having a lot of programmability will enable such applications as that and make it easier to um, for everyone to integrate with with these systems. Any more questions? Nope. Okay. Thank you very much. Thanks so much.